Dr. James Sabuka has been the president of the National Council for Accreditation of Teacher Education, which you know as NCATE, since 2008. He also serves as the president of the new unified accrediting body, the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation. Since the beginning of his presidency, Dr. Sabuka has been focused on making accreditation a lever for change and reform in teacher preparation or educator development. Dr. Sabuka and his team are working now to ensure that the accreditation process focuses on strengthening educator preparation through continuous improvement and research-based transformation. Next we have Dr. Charles Koble. Dr. Koble is the co-director of the Science and Mathematics Teacher Imperative with the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities. He is also the founder of the Third Mile Group, an independent education and social, social policy organization. And NICTAP has been fortunate in the past to do some work with Dr. Koble and the Third Mile Group, especially around um, teacher retirement. Dr. Koble is the former Vice President of Policy Studies and Programs at the Education Commission of the States and was a professor of science education for 23 years and Dean for 13 years of the School of Education at East Carolina University. Finally, we have Dr. Rick Melmer. Dr. Melmer is the Dean of the School of Education at the University of South Dakota. Prior to coming to the university, Dr. Melmer served as the Secretary of Education for the State of South Dakota for five years, and in fact has experience in South Dakota at all levels of the K-12 education system. He was a classroom teacher for five years, an elementary principal for seven years, and worked as a school superintendent for 12 years. So I'm, I'm guessing if anyone knows the ins and outs of South Dakota, the South Dakota education system, it's Dr. Melmer. So each presenter will have about 15 minutes, and then we'll open up for questions. Dr. Sabuka, will you start? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I think Tom Carroll really uh, framed uh, the challenge that we have very well. It is a systemic <coughs> challenge. We, um, we have to change the system in which we're operating. And I, I really, I hadn't heard this term before, transformational remodeling. I like that a lot because I, that's what I think I'm doing, uh, what I'm in the midst of right now in accreditation. But I wanted to say that um, while Nick Taff took this systemic perspective uh, back in the mid-90s and has since, I still see precious little of a systemic reform uh, commitment in our country. And I think this is uh, very lamentable. We continue to search for silver bullets that are going to um, solve our educational attainment problem. and. Um, uh, we've gone from one thing to another. Uh, for some time now, we've begun to focus on teachers as distinct from teaching, which Nick Taft tries to help us understand is not the same uh, perspective. But I do see um, a growing momentum uh, for reform coming from uh, a variety of quarters. I, in the nearly five years that I have been at NCATE, I've seen a growing uh, awareness and acceptance on the part of the higher education community, schools of education, that they must change the way that they have traditionally prepared teachers and other educators. I see much more um, activism on the part of the policy community, at uh, particularly at the state level, um, and the recent report that the Council of Chief State School Officers released, uh, which called for a new uh, approach on the part of the states to improving uh, teacher and educator development is uh, a very encouraging sign. Um, the teachers uh, teacher unions, both associations, have released high-profile reports uh, calling for reform. So I do see uh, the, um, 
the growing awareness that we have a major problem, even though we don't have a common understanding at this point of what it will take to change this system or non-system that we're in and move it toward one that, uh, as uh, Tom has described, is one uh, characterized by educator development and a professional learning community. Why do we have to change the system? Well, first of all, because um, of the nature of the student, P12 student population that we have. Uh, it's a diverse, increasingly diverse population uh, from whom we are demanding more than ever before with the new college and career ready standards. And um, it, um, it poses a major challenge uh, for the nation. And uh, it's a tech savvy um, student population and the old approach to teaching is not working effectively with this new group of students. If it uh, has been challenged in the past, it, I think uh, technology is undercutting the old system more than ever before. And secondly, uh, we have to change because of this global interconnected uh, environment in which we live, uh, one which is inevitably an open system. Uh, but the educational system that we have is still, in many respects, built upon closed system principles. Uh, and it is, in fits and starts, tried to be responsive, but it's built on an old set of principles that are no longer uh, applicable in today's uh, environment where, incidentally, our knowledge base about effective teaching and learning is increasing. And so we need a model which allows uh, professionals, teachers, and other educators to work together collaboratively in order to share that new knowledge. Uh, that's just you know one aspect of this interconnected uh, global world that we're, uh, we're in. So we're beginning to see the legitimacy of the old system break down without a full vision of what the new uh, system will require. Uh, but make no mistake about it, the old system is not sustainable uh, and it's losing legitimacy. Uh, I think the question is really whether the profession is willing and able to stand uh, up and take the initiative in reshaping the new system. What I see is a great deal of reactive behavior on the part of the different stakeholders in the profession rather than a proactive approach. And many of the uh, reform nostrums that are out there are coming from the outside and they're not all very thoughtful. Uh, in fact, they um, may undercut what we're trying to accomplish with respect to building a new system. Uh, so the voice of the profession is very much uh, needed uh, in this building this new uh, system and um, that must include uh, classroom teachers uh, practicing professionals at the grassroots level. The old top-down uh, model uh, of uh, authority, of knowledge dissemination is antithetical to this new uh, collaborative system, network-based system that we have to uh, build. Well, <clears throat> uh, when we think about the agents of change, um, certainly accreditation is one that I think a lot about because we, in a highly fragmented uh, policy environment, one where we have 50 uh, states setting uh, standards, having a national voice about the importance of uh, quality educator development is an important uh, development. And this isn't to diminish the voice of organizations like NICTAF, but as a national accreditor, we actually have authority to uh, try to bring about change uh, within the way uh, 
teachers are prepared and educators are developed. And so uh, one, of the, one of the things I want to emphasize this morning is that accreditation is part of this uh, systemic change. It's an agent of this systemic change uh, that needs to occur. And as we create uh, a new accrediting body, CAPE, uh, we have an unprecedented opportunity to um, reshape uh, this uh, system. Um, one of the ways we can do that is through a new set of standards that uh, guide the preparation of teachers and other educators. And CAPE is in the process of doing that. It's taken a very collaborative approach to the development of these standards. We have a commission, a CAPE Commission on Standards and Performance Reporting, which consists of 41 uh, members, a uh, very distinguished group of stakeholders that in includes critics of teacher preparation. It's co-chaired by a higher education dean, Camila Benbow of Vanderbilt University, and um, a P-12 chief, uh, Terry Holliday, the commissioner of Kentucky. And that is intentionally uh, a collaborative co-chairing model to underscore the need for us to transform the system uh, so that uh, we prepare educators in a collaborative way between higher education and P-12. We took that same approach with the Blue Ribbon Panel report on clinical preparation and partnerships for improved P-12 student learning. Uh, Tom uh, Carroll was uh, a very, uh, very active and uh, important member of that panel, and it also was co-chaired between higher education and P-12. So collaboration is something that um, we believe is necessary in rebuilding this system and in the way it much, must operate. And one of the uh, things that I want to emphasize <clears throat> is that uh, clinical preparation it has to be at the core of the way we prepare uh, educators for the future. And this does seem to be something uh, that a lot of stakeholders are agreeing upon. I know that it's been very much part of Nick Taft's agenda and part of the T-Link uh, set of principles. I, I noticed the tremendous overlap between what we are trying to do in CAPE and what T-Link uh, has recommended with regard to uh, strategic partnerships uh, between preparation programs and P-12 schools, uh, a uh, very strong focus on um, uh, candidates learning in an interactive um, professional community, the use of technology uh, to foster high impact uh, preparation, the use of data uh, for continuous improvement within this professional learning community. Uh, so, as while the Commission has not released its um, draft standards for vetting, we'll be doing that the middle of next month for reaction. While we have not done that, I can give you a preview that um, I, I know that the standards that are going to be uh, recommended will include strategic partnerships that are co-constructed. Uh, between um, higher education and providers where there is a shared vision and shared uh, responsibility. Uh, these have to be partnerships that are mutually beneficial and demonstrate continuous um, improvement. They have to be real and on ongoing, not merely a memorandum of understanding. We have to prepare teachers in a new collaborative way. And secondly, the clinical component that is being uh, recommended will be uh, woven throughout the preparation program, not merely an add-on uh, at the end of a preparation uh, program, uh, so that teacher candidates, uh, when they graduate from their programs, uh, demonstrate that they are ready to work effectively with diverse learners uh, in a collaborative way uh, in today's uh, classrooms. And 
the clinical requirement will require a uh, model of growth and continuous improvement uh, between P12 and higher education. Uh, the teachers who are working with teacher candidates uh, will have to be qualified and have to receive professional development around rich clinical experiences. So this alone is a very different approach to the way we have prepared teachers and I think it's when it's linked to some of the other systemic changes that Tom was speaking of uh, has the potential to help move us to a new system. The standards will also address greater recruitment and selectivity on the part of uh, the candidates. They will address uh, the uh, need for the candidates to have rich content knowledge and how to teach that knowledge uh, effectively. And um, the new accreditation system will work much more, much more around evidence, around transparency in terms of reporting of outcomes. It's going to be a different kind of approach. So uh, I really appreciate being invited this morning. I do want to say that um, I think Tom has, uh, has been a leader in helping us think about this challenge, national challenge that we have as a systemic challenge. And I look forward to working with the members uh, the, of your T-Link initiative and um, in trying to shift to a system that will serve the needs of our nation. Well, um, I'm Charles Colwell, and I want to make a confession to the small group that I would never make in a very large group, and that is, uh, as was said in the opening comments, if you listen very carefully, that I was a dean for 13 years. So really, I was a dean for far less than that. I was paid to be a dean for 13 years. Uh, the first few years was me discovering I didn't know what I was doing, okay? So after I got over lockjaw, from being clenched teeth every day, and uh, only my dentist knew uh, the real secret, and that was I, my wisdom teeth were not coming in. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, after I figured out, sort of, what I was doing, the rest of the 13 years was trying to do that. And it reminded me, Tom, of the very, I had the good fortune of being in North Carolina on the day that the National Commission <clears throat> convened for the first time, Jim Hunt and all of his glory in North Carolina. Every state deserves a Jim Hunt, by the way. But anyway, uh, he uh, put me on sort of as a, the last minute speaker after a long day of speeches. And the only thing worth saying, I think, maybe that day was that this is great but implementation is a highly underrated skill, okay? Now, you're about the business of trying to implement a big idea. I don't think you're about a project. I think you're about reformation, as Tom said. So this is not a project you're involved in. This is a change in the way you do business around here. So uh, I'm gonna share with you my four insights of 13 years of being a dean, okay? Now, if I can figure out how to use the technology, what do I hit first, okay? That one, okay, we're good. Okay, and the first insight, not in the order in which I had these insights, was that teacher education begins a long time before it begins. Now, my son really was, helped me understand that when he was applying to veterinary school. He didn't get in the first time. And, uh, you know, his mother and I uh, tried to advise him, well, maybe there's always medicine you can go into as a lesser profession, you know, if you're not into, so, you know, he wants to solve dog problems and horse problems and cat problems. He did not want to be a medical doctor. So uh, I had a chance to talk with the dean of the School of Veterinary Medicine about his not being accepted. And he said, you know, uh, Charles, the, the, one of the reasons your son did not get accepted, he, he expressed almost nothing about what he had done to think about what he wanted to do. He had pretty decent grades. He was 3.2 average, but the average in vet school was 3.7. And that veterinarians, by the way, Tom, were experiencing a genuine shortage. They had raised their standards to the point on academics only that they were beginning to recruit people into that profession who really actually didn't want to do the dailyness of running a business of veterinary practice. You're not just taking care of cats and dogs, you're also balancing the books. Okay, 
So they were having a shortage of people going into the profession and dropping out of the profession. A group of veterinarians in a medical school at ECU got my son together and they talked with him for a full day to prepare him for his second interview. When he went in the second time, he, they fully got that this boy was a, was a veterinarian waiting to be trained, waiting to be educated. His passion for his work, his dedication from cleaning the cages as a, you know, as a 10 year old to, to almost being a veterinarian by the time he finished college uh, working with other vets, they got it and they got him in. Now he's a veterinarian. I'm real proud of that. Proud, proud for him because that's what he wanted to do. But it also talked to me a lot about the way we were going about thinking about recruiting people into our profession. And that is, are we looking for the kind of people who are teachers ready to be prepared, ready to go? They've done things in scouting and, uh, you know, uh, uh, boys clubs, girls clubs, church groups, uh, whatever. But they have been about this business and they can show you, they can demonstrate to you that that's what they want to do. And so my sort of summation of all that is that I felt that as a dean, we were doing a pretty good job of accepting people into our program. That is, we had our standards, we had jacked them up all the way to 2.5 and by 2.2. You know, we had interview processes, but we really were just accepting people. We weren't recruiting people into our profession. So I want us to think about, that's my first insight. We, we had to do a much better job. And I, lately I've been working with a lot with uh, uh, Teach for America, I think they've shown us some really good things that we need to pay attention to about how we go out and get people with a lot of passion and drive to come into our profession. Uh, now, so that's, that's my first insight. So now, let me move on to, let's see if I can do this. Oh yeah, oh I know where would I, where'd I go, oh yeah. Teacher education, oh yeah, here we go. Who's doing this? You're doing it, okay, I'm not doing it anymore. You're doing it, okay, all right. Teacher preparation, oh no, let's, let's go back one. Go back one, okay. All right, I'm missing one. All right, let's go past this one to, uh, let's see if I can find it. There we go, there we go. I got them in the, in the wrong order. And that is, I used to feel really good. I mean, how many of you actually went to your graduation ceremonies as undergraduates? Did you actually go? All right, that is the greatest day for a dean ever. Because you get to set up on stage, and after you get over the speech, uh, you know, you get to, uh, and especially if you're a school of education dean, because you generally have more people out there getting ready to throw their hats up in the air and scream and yell than anybody on stage. And so on graduation day, I felt really, really good because, you know, I would announce, here are my graduates, they would scream and yell, and I would leave the stage feeling really good until Monday or Tuesday of next week or next, now whatever, I would start running into these people in the banks, selling me insurance, selling me cars. I'm saying, why, why aren't you teaching? Well, Dr. Coble, Dean Coble, or whatever they call me at the time, you know, uh, you know, you did a good job, but I don't know. I just didn't feel like I was really prepared for the job that I got. We had some really, really great schools we put them into, just not the schools they were hired into, okay? So they didn't know how to teach in those schools. So I began to feel really bad on graduation day thereafter. I began to feel like it was child abandonment day. And that what we were doing, we were casting hundreds of graduates out there with absolutely no structure in our state, no commitment on the part of our university, no commitment on the part of me and our faculty to support these people whose <clears throat> dreams were being washed up on the shore of despair in many cases. Then I started thinking about my own son out there as a veterinarian practice and the kind of support he gets and now a solo practice. He was with a group of people for a number of years, for 10 years, uh, working with them in a large practice. Now he has a smaller practice of his own design. But on any given day, most of the days, you know, the dogs and cats that will come into his practice, it's routine, he knows exactly what to do, he could do it blindfolded. But every now and then, it's not that case. And on that day, he has this little machine right here with the camera pointed right here, with the telephone in, uh, in the other hand, talking to home base back in Raleigh. 
and they guide him through the process of what to do with that animal. Or say, Chris, you better put this one on the, put, put this one on the bus and send him to Raleigh. Okay. But he has instant demand, on demand uh, support from his vet school. He's been out of vet school 12 years. Okay. But any day he has this number, he's now memorized, and can call them and get that kind of support and help. I wish every teacher had that kind of support and help in the classroom every day because they also run into really different situations in which they have almost no support to do that. <clears throat> and we're still doing, we're still doing to teachers uh, what Ted Britton wrote about years ago, the sink or swim and too many are sinking. Uh, my first year teacher teaching, I was assigned three classes as a, as a, that will stand out forever in my memory. Uh, the first one was a group of 32 kids in biology class. The only thing they, that those 32 kids had in common was that every single one of them had flunked biology twice before me, first year teacher, is now getting ready to teach them. I did not teach them. I just survived the year, okay, with them. Okay, second class, uh, required physical science uh, class, uh, these students had, uh, all flunked every, all the physics, all the chemistry courses, and they were putting this physical science class with a first year teacher, okay. And the third class, no God, no, I mean, no, no kidding, this is honest God truth, 42 kids in the class. Now, I wish that that has, were only true, I'm still a certified teacher, by the way, I wish that were still the case 40 years later. I wish that weren't still the case. The problem is, it's still the case 40 years later. And so we still have this work to do, the systemic work of helping, not just because uh, uh, we, we should, because it's necessary. So let's, I want to uh, move on from there, though, and go to my third insight, and that's about, uh, I thought when I became a dean of education, Rick, that I was the boss. I thought I was in charge of teacher education at this institution. And I acted like it for a while until I realized that I wasn't in charge, that, the, that this was a team sport, but I was treating it like a solo activity, okay? And so the rest of the university, in fact, most of the university was more responsible for the preparation of those teachers than I was and so, as the dean. And so how to move into that alignment uh, and m build genuine internal and external partners uh, with people inside the university and external to the university, the partnerships we talk about. So there are partnerships inside and outside that need to be built. And not, by the way, just with the schools. There are all these girls clubs, boys clubs, all kinds of activities I've mentioned earlier that are out there going on and that they employ teachers to be and teachers in real. Uh, so uh, there's a lot to work on. Now let me go to the last, last slide, if you will. And that is, this is sort of, I don't oh, it's not gonna all get on there. Okay, so somehow it's a whole lot of information. Oh, there it is, good, okay. So the, the last part of this is, you know, like the one part of it is the beginning of the game, getting in, the, getting on the boat. That is the people you want on this boat. And then, what does the end of the game look like? And I felt like the end of the game was the day of graduation. It wasn't. And then, who's in the game? It's all these other people in the university and outside the university. And then my question was, what is the game? You know, really, what are we doing? And so I'm struggling with trying to come up with a model for think, thinking about this whole process of what it, what is the game. And so this is my cut at it right here. Just sort of we, okay, recruitment, we got to, you know, we, that's, that's the whole game, sort of. And looking across that continuum, but what this probably doesn't show is the feedback loops all along the way. That is getting the information from one part of that system into other parts of that system and understand more and more and getting the feedback and then acting on that feedback. The kind of thing, Jim, I know that, uh, CAPE is committed to, which is taking the feedback from our graduates and putting it back in and improving our program based upon that. So it's a system of continuous improvement, uh, not just one of we get them there and it's all over. But what we have conceptualized is a, is a team sport, but we haven't acted on making that a reality yet. And that is we still see the cooperating teachers as a separate part of the game than our teacher candidates and our faculty. These are team members and my uh, and, and involved in the continued in the initial development and continuous improvement of teachers. 
My best example of that comes out of an industrial setting I saw in DuPont one time very close to East Carolina University, which they were going from preparing Dacron this way, manufacturing Dacron this way, to manufacturing Dacron this way. Now, what was that way? You walked into this kind of dusty room with fibers all over the air and with people with oil things fixing things and screwdrivers and people all over the floor trying to make this Dacron work, machines work better and make the Dacron at the end of the day. They had a wall, and on the other side of that wall was the new Dacron factory that was eventually going to look like this. Uh, you know, this was, this was going to change this part eventually. Over here, there were groups of people around computers talking about the data coming across the machines. There were no fibers drifting around the air, and they were problem solving as a team trying to improve the way they prepared Dacron. And upstairs were these team members being trained by the community colleges to do this work and eventually they tore this down. Now, I would have paid DuPont to keep that in place, you know, if I'd had the money, because it showed old world, old way of doing business, new world, new way of doing business, and the development that had to go on to make that happen. And I think you're sort of in that game. Uh, that is, how do we transform the work to produce the product, if you will, in a very, very different way than we've done in the past? But we have to be prepared to do it, your network to make that happen, and I think it's an exciting run your own. So I see uh, sort of what you're into, again, is not a project. Uh, you're into a transformation. And but 20 seconds ago, it's yours, Rick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, uh, uh, Charles. And I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be invited to uh, become a fan of, of Tom's over the last several years and just appreciate his vision and, and desire to change the profession. And as you heard in uh, my introduction, I really am a K-12 educator by trade. I uh, spent most of my career in K-12 education and now, uh, and if you use Charles as example, I'm still learning how to be a dean. I'm, I'm in my fifth year and and there's a lot of truth to that. I still really don't understand completely uh, what's going on and, and how, uh, how we can fix it. But uh, I've gone to the dark side twice. Uh, once when I went to this state education agency and I had my K-12 colleagues tell me, you've gone to the dark side. And uh, what I found out when I got to the state education agency is the folks in that agency really did care about schools and kids and were trying to do the very best job that they could. But the schools just gave them very little credit for any of that kind of work. Then I went to higher ed, and my colleagues told me, now you're going to the other dark side, uh, you know, and, and those folks don't get it either. Uh, and I found out when I got to higher ed that these folks work very hard. They're trying to do the best they can do. Uh, interestingly, I think the incentives at higher ed, at least this is my perspective, are inconsistent with what we want to establish in terms of partnerships with K-12 education, because higher ed folks are being reinforced to research and to write and oftentimes service is downplayed in terms of importance in P&T or promotion and tenure. So there's no wonder why there's uh, not as much effort to connect and more effort to write and to do research and to secure grants. And yet K-12 is criticizing higher ed when in fact the reward system at higher ed doesn't encourage people to work and play together. Uh, I wish I could tell you that some of the changes we're making at the University of South Dakota came from within, but they haven't. Uh, the Bush Foundation out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, there, it's a foundation that, that supports uh, Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. And that foundation made a decision that, that they wanted to reform some teacher ed programs in that three-state region. So they were looking for a partner in South Dakota. And uh, I was just leaving uh, my role as Secretary of Education and moving to the university at that point. And they came alongside and said, would you like to join us in this teacher ed redesign effort? And of course, I said that would be a great way to jump into the pool here. And I was excited about it. The president and the provost were as well. And so we got in the game. So it was a very unconventional kind of top-down effort to redesign our teacher ed program. And as you can imagine, if you have higher ed background, uh, those are never looked at favorably when you walk in and say, we're going to make some of these changes. Uh, but we're, we're making good changes, and we're making good progress, I think, uh, relatively speaking. And it's built around some of the same pillars that Charles just finished talking about, recruit, prepare, place, support. A lot of what we're going to be talking about today is on the support end, so I, I want to get to that, but just briefly talking about those other three pillars, recruiting a higher quality 
student. You know, oftentimes we do not get the kind of quality that we're looking for in teacher ed programs. We get students that decide, you know, uh, I can't do other things, so I'll, I'll elect to teach. And I know that's sort of an overused term, but it's true, still going on today. Uh, so we need to, and we're trying to be more purposeful about recruiting a higher quality student. For lack of a better metric, we're using ACT as a big guide for us uh, in South Dakota to measure the kind of preparation that, that we think uh, our high school students need to be successful as a classroom teacher. We also are trying to gauge market needs better, uh, asking schools what your needs are and then trying to steer students uh, towards those needs. Uh, we over, tend to overproduce elementary ed majors and underproduce many of the content areas at the high school level. Social studies tends to be overproduced, physical education we have plenty of, but almost every other content area in the high school level we seem to underproduce. And part of that is uh, a lack of student interest in that content area coming in, and part of it is higher ed's answer to that, that they have to have, I think, an excessive number of content courses before they have spent a single day in the school to understand how to apply that content to meaningful uh, classroom instruction. So, so we are trying to recruit more purposefully and we're incentivizing students that say, I want to teach this content area or I want to go teach in this geographic location. And if they say that, we incentivize them. If they say, I want to be an elementary ed major, we say good luck and welcome to the University of South Dakota, but we're probably not going to provide them with a lot of financial assistance. And some people might find that offensive, uh, I'm a former elementary ed teacher, and so I use that a lot when I talk, talk to people and say, it's all about market-driven uh, products anymore. And my business friends continually tell me, if you treat everybody the same, you're going to get exactly what you're uh, vying for. So we do need to start differentiating, not only at the higher ed level, but I believe K-12 needs to start differentiating their compensation based on market needs and availability of people, which, as you can imagine, isn't received well by my former colleagues when I talk about that. The second piece is preparation, which by far has been the most difficult thing to change. I was surprised when I arrived at the university and found out that the first year belongs almost exclusively to the university, that we have virtually no input into the first year of, of uh, higher ed. So I've, you know, here we are training teachers, but the first year, virtually no contact. Uh, we're trying to change that. We're trying to uh, creep our way into general ed courses. And I'm, I'm uh, asking why uh, do our students have to take these general ed courses when there are others that could be taken that would be more relevant to their teacher ed program? Uh, I know my mic's kicking in and out here. But, uh, uh, so we're, and we're making some progress. Uh, we just uh, have created a, a science course now that's a full year science course for elementary ed majors where they're going to get eight weeks of physics, eight weeks of chemistry, eight weeks of biology, eight weeks of earth science, all applied to teachers and classroom. Biology in the second semester taught generically to everybody that's in the room. So we're starting to creep our way into that first year and we need to uh, because we're still, I'm committed to getting the program done in four years. Uh, but we not only are fighting our general ed battles, the Board of Regents system reduced recently from 128 to 120. So we credits for our majors uh, that we had before. Uh, and then, and, and we also have moved to what I would consider to be the signature program or change that we're making. We're moving from a 12-week student teaching experience to a full-year residency model. So beginning next fall, uh, we have a transition where we have some students that are seniors next year that are on the old catalog, which will still be a semester-long student teaching, 12 weeks. And then we have a group of students uh, that are under the new catalog which will be a full year residency model. Thank you. So we're gonna have about 60 of our students next year, uh, beginning the year in their school and ending their year in their school. They're gonna to come to a hub site and take courses all day long. They're gonna teach Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, the following year, all of our uh, majors, with the exception of, I have to make this clear, with the exception of music and art, uh, we have been up to this point unsuccessful in convincing our music and art folks uh, that they should release some content and allow our, uh, their students to, to do a residency year for a full year. Uh, they believe content is much more important than an extra semester of student teaching. 
And so, uh, as Charles talked about, we don't have full control over everything that's happening, so all we can do is do what we can do. We hope over time they're going to see the benefit of a full year residency model, but up to this point, not. Our secondary ed majors will be involved in this, and we're going to be one of the few programs in the country uh, that are doing this K through 12 with all areas, like I said, except music and art. When you start to think about the student teaching experience currently, 12 weeks, you watch for a week, sometimes 10 days to two weeks, then you teach one class for a week. I mean, I'm, do, I'm talking about the traditional model here. Then you maybe add another class, and then pretty soon you're teaching everything for five or six weeks. And then the last week or so, we encourage them to go out and observe other teachers, which can't be a bad thing to do. But when you think about it, they've probably taught a full day for about five or six weeks. And then we pronounce them on graduation day ready to teach. And then we wonder why when they get out into the field, the romantic idea that they had about teaching from college is different than what they're really experiencing because they haven't experienced what a real year looks like. We're hoping that the students at the University of South Dakota beginning next year are going to have a better understanding that when they begin the year with their teacher and end the year with their teacher, that they're going to have a greater feel for what a full year of teaching really does in fact look like. And then every Tuesday, they get to come together with their colleagues and say, I'm having trouble with a student in my classroom. What can I do differently? And they get to brainstorm with a clinical faculty member involved to talk a little bit about how that experience can be improved. So we're really excited about this. Uh, even though we, I don't ex assume it's going to, quote, fix uh, teacher ed, I think it's the lever that needs to be uh, pulled that will be a catalyst for many of the other changes that have to happen. Uh, our coursework uh, is still not aligned as well as it should be to the clinical experiences. We're getting better at that. Small changes like in our junior year, it used to be uh, 40 assorted hours of clinical experience. And that might be true in some of your uh, universities as well. Uh, we're making a subtle change to say it's all going to be in one week. You're going to spend one week in a school, Monday through Friday, 8 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, instead of 40 assorted hours where you float in for an hour, out for an hour, in for an hour. Again, does that really give our students at the junior year a real picture of what teaching's like? No. That's not what teaching's like, to roll in for an hour and roll out for an hour because I got an hour-long uh, break in between two classes, so I'm going to go pop in and watch for an hour and then come back to the campus. So we're trying to replicate as often as we can the real life experiences that teachers are going to see when they get out into the field. And by the way, our K-12 partners, for the first time, I believe, are engaged in our work. They, they're, they're cheering us on. They're encouraging us in this effort. And if you want to do a full year residency program uh, with your area schools, you have no choice but to be engaged. Uh, you have to be, because that's the only way you're going to make it work. And our partnership has never been stronger uh, now with our K-12 uh, folks. The other thing that uh, we've taken for granted in the past has been if someone was vertical and had taught for more than three years, they were a candidate to mentor uh, some of our teachers. And we're now saying you have to go, we're requiring people to go through co-teaching training, which is becoming common across the country, uh, where it's two people in the room teaching at the same time instead of one person teaching and one person watching. Uh, that's also been received very well. Schools are excited about it, and we think it's a partnership, again, that's going to strengthen our relationship. The final part is support. Uh, the Bush Foundation is requiring us to stay with our graduates for two to three years after graduation. So now the only group that stays in touch with our graduates is the foundation office. In the future, it's going to be the School of Education and the foundation office. And we are going to uh, look for ways uh, to stay connected. And that's going to be a, a struggle because our students oftentimes do not want to stay connected to us. I was telling Tom and Sophie on the phone the other day, it's a little bit like a student leaving uh, co you know, for college. I don't want to be connected to mom and dad anymore. I want to do my own thing. Our students give us that same feeling. So we're hoping and expecting that the relationship that they have with that clinical faculty member during that full year residency is going to help us. That clinical faculty member is going to be our conduit for those graduates that are out in the field. Because there is going to be, after a full year, there is going to be a relationship there. And we're hoping that the clinical faculty member can help us stay connected to that uh, graduate in the field. And second of all, we're counting on the building principals. As a former principal and superintendent, I would know this. If I got contacted by the university saying, you just hired one of our graduates, 
We want to make sure that our graduate's doing a good job in the field. Will you help us stay connected to that graduate? We want to know uh, how he or she is doing. We want feedback on their performance. And if it's not up to par, we want to know. We want to help. I would have welcomed that as a building principal. I would have been, first of all, shocked. But second of all, would have said, that's a wonderful message to receive from the university, that they care enough about their graduates to follow them out into the field and make sure, I'll make sure that that teacher stays connected to that university. So I, I think we have to use existing relationships to, to carve out that niche to stay connected to our graduates. The, the technology piece, I think, is going to be fine. I mean, in South Dakota, as Charles knows, when you travel our state, if you don't stay connected virtual, virtually, you're not going to stay connected. Uh, there's a lot of distance between us. So we're, we're satisfied that the Skype and the FaceTime and all the things that are going on there can work on the mentoring side. I think the challenge is getting the relationships in place to make sure that that is articulated the way you want it to be articulated. And I'm going to welcome uh, and listen carefully to some of your thoughts about how that can be done better. Uh, I just know that uh, this reform effort is not easy and it's not going to happen quickly. And it's really an all hands on deck approach. Everybody on the campus and all the external agencies like accrediting body bodies need to continue to challenge us uh, to do some things differently. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen on our own. So I welcome the chance to interact uh, in the Q&A portion. And thanks for the opportunity to share. Thank you, so, no, I don't know. Thank you so much for those presentations. And I can see already that people have questions. Um, Melinda's going to walk around with a microphone. So if you do have a question, just raise your hand. And please introduce yourself and let us know where you're from before you ask your question. Good morning. Um, my name is Andrea Hayek. And uh, I am with the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. Uh, so first to Dr. Koble, I was delighted to see that in your continuum, you included National Board Certification. Um, and my question to any of the panelists now is, how, many te how may teacher preparation programs uh, include National Board cert Certified teachers in a collaborative model so that these teachers um, are working with accomplished teachers before they join the teaching workforce? Let me, let me give one case study because we have a person on T-Link that's from a university that hired the very first National Board Certified Teacher in our state to be on their faculty. That was UNC Greensboro. This National Board Certified Teacher took a substantial salary cut to join the faculty at UNCG to be a part of that. Now, you know, in our state we have, uh, we're proud to say, more National Board Certified Teachers than any state including Florida, you know, uh, but uh, the idea is they are dressed up and they need a place to go and they're valuable members of clinical faculty and teachers in residence. There's a little mentor fact, uh, sometimes master teachers with particular roles and sometimes uh, teacher in residence with particular, a little bit slightly different roles, but the idea is that you just don't want to let that talent uh, uh, completely uh, bypass the preparation and ongoing development of other teachers. One of the, uh, and I'll relinquish this time here just a minute, but I don't think there's any database on what you're asking about, to my knowledge, though there might be, unless you all have conducted that research. But uh, the question is how, how often and how many are deployed. I know it's big in our state only because National Board is big in our state and we believe in it. But I must say, I just finished a, a project, uh, it, was, it was a project, uh, a task, of developing, um, uh, seeking consensus on what a lot of national experts believe were the high water mark in terms of how we should prepare science and math teachers. And I interviewed, uh, a, and you would know this person, a National Board Certified Teacher in North Carolina, a Presidential Award winner, National Teacher of the Year, Science Teacher of the Year in our state, who had never been asked by the university, which was less than two miles away, ever, to be on that campus, to work with their student teachers, to work with their faculty, to be involved in seminars, although she had been used as a supervising teacher for years. I thought that was the saddest story <laughs> I had heard in all the interviews that we conducted. So we have work to do. Okay. 
I would just mention uh, in South Dakota, we did a pilot, a small pilot uh, last year uh, of our full year residency program. And we had a national board certified teacher as the clinical faculty member for that program in Sioux Falls. Uh, ten stu only 10 students involved. Uh, seven of them were hired by the Sioux Falls School District uh, following that year. The other three didn't want to work in Sioux Falls. They wanted to work other places. So every one of the students that wanted to remain in Sioux Falls was hired in Sioux Falls. And the National Board Certified Teacher is now a faculty member on our faculty, and she'll continue to teach the clinical faculty uh, portions of it during our full-year residency program. I find it interesting when we talked about who is going to teach the clinical faculty portion out in the field. Higher ed folks were worried that it was going to be K-12 people. K-12 people were worried it was going to be higher ed people. Mm -hmm. So if you think that we've you know, gone miles in our relationship, there's still work to do there. I think as we build stronger strategic partnerships between higher ed and P-12 in the preparation of educators, this is a resource that needs to be built in. And I believe we need to think of different staffing models uh, in preparing teachers as well as uh, delivering uh, content to our P-12 students. We need more uh, bridge-spanning roles uh, where we have blended uh, support systems between P-12 and higher education. And um, so we've, as we build the partnerships, we've got to think of more cost-effective ways of delivering uh, content both to the candidates and to our P-12 students. This one. Yes. Uh, I'm Terry Taylor, and I'm um, with Education Council here in Washington, D.C. Um, actually, my question is for Dean Melmore, but I'm hoping the others can weigh in. Um, I know that South Dakota recently had voter referenda about their education reform laws in the P-12 schools, um, particularly with regard to teacher evaluation. And so I'm curious, as you, um, as a dean who's doing all of these new programs, when, you, when politically some of those ideas seem like they're not taking root, um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? And yeah, we, we had a, a, ma a mandatory teacher evaluation initiative uh, along with some other things that went down in a voter referendum. And uh, uh, actually, on the, on the college campuses, uh, people look at that as refreshing. Um, I'm not sure that's really how it is, but uh, the, the idea that we can still choose ourselves instead of having the state, as I said, the state's perceived to be the dark side and you're making us do things that we don't want to do. Uh, but what we have chosen to do is adopt the state's initiative. Uh, we are using, in this case, the Charlotte Danielson Framework for Teaching. And I think it has implications for the support side. We're going to be building our sort of support system for our uh, teachers that are going out around the Danielson Framework for Teaching model. And every state can decide how they want to do it. There are four domains. So our thought is that we would build our support around those four domains. So when we ask principals and teachers, how are you doing out there, um, they, their concerns will fall in one of those four domains. Uh, and then we, if we build in videos and we build in support materials around those four domains, we'll know how to tailor our interventions uh, back to that teacher based on uh, domains uh, one, two, three, or four through the Danielson model. So I, think, uh, I don't think people really looked at it as being negative. I think they looked at it more as we still get to choose what we want to do. We think the framework's going to still be very popular in our state, and the universities have embraced it. Uh, as, a, as a way to sort of train our teachers on here's how you're going to be evaluated, and then we think it could be a good guide in our support efforts as well. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Saroja Barnes from AACTE. Um, <clears throat> I also was very um, excited about the continuum that you had up there and sort of the conversation in general about the connections and collaborations. Um, to take a phrase from my colleague in Tennessee, um, Candy Hill Clark, um, she talks about moving from placements to partnerships. Um, and I think that that's sort of what this is all about and what we're talking about today. What I was interested in hearing from you all, um, and I'm going to make a little plug here um, because of my role at AACTE with EdTPA, is I'm sort of interested in um, wh where you all see teacher performance assessment for beginning teachers, for teacher candidates. Um, in this conversation, particularly the connections with um, those assessments, whether it's ID TPA or something else you're using, and the teacher evaluation systems that our candidates are going to be um, subject to when they get there. 
Well, if, if, uh, if I could get that model back up there on the screen, which I don't know how to do, but <laughs> <clears throat> our technical assistant team in the back know, you'll notice after preparation, that initial license, the little circles there. All right, so my declaration is that EdTap, the Daniels, the, the, this is the missing piece. We have to have this in place. That whole, to me, that whole sort of continuum, and there may be different ways of structuring this model. I'm just playing around with this one. But that's a big piece of it. it, it, it that out of the picture, we have a big problem in terms of knowing where we're we going, what are we driving toward, how do we know we're getting there, that sort of thing. So I, I just see it as a critical, absolutely, and I applaud Linda's and everybody's work on this. It's just absolutely essential. And everybody knows that she was very involved in this organization as well. And now moving that progression, moving that ball down the street. Now, my question, and, I, and I, this, is, this represents my weakness in understanding that the EdTEP, Ed, EdTPA right now, I don't know, and I think Tom, you and you, this group will have to just say that to us, is does that performance model support this more team-oriented, collaborative, um, you know, differentiated staffing model? I just don't know. So I'm, it's not being critical. It's just a big missing piece of my knowledge base. If it does, I think it's absolutely on target. You know, well, e even if EdTPA is just implemented by the higher ed institutions, it's a very important step uh, because, first of all, it provides a kind of quality assurance at exit that we haven't had in the past with paper and pencil tests. Uh, but secondly, it also uh, provides an opportunity uh, for uh, the um, for the preparation programs to learn from one another about the uh, quality of their candidates because we will have a benchmarking opportunity that we really haven't had in the past. But I truly hope that it will then be a tied to licensure, both initial licensure and in uh, some states to second tier licensure so that we can then use what's in EdTPA, follow it to a more advanced level of performance, and use that again as a feedback loop back to the preparation programs. This would create a kind of uh, conceptual, intellectual coherence that's really missing right now in our country. Yeah, the only thing I'll just say, is I, I really have become more of a proponent of the tiered licensure system where, where people are initially licensed and then earn their a permanent licensure after they're in the field. We do not have that in, in South Dakota, and I don't know how many states in the country do. But uh, back to a new point I made earlier, I've been watching our secondary ed majors who, who are just being forced to take content courses that I think far exceed anything they're ever going to teach, and they have no context of how to apply those content courses in a K-12 classroom. In a tiered licensure system, you could give them a foundational base in the, in the content, <coughs> and then have them continue to take content courses while they're in that provisional period of their licensure uh, when they're out in the field and can add meaning to what they're learning. And I think ultimately you'd have a stronger teacher when you're done and, and you could also track them better because they're still linked and tethered to the university at the same time. So I think there's a lot of promise in the tier licensure system. I'm sure there's all kinds of issues, political issues primarily as to why uh, they aren't going to happen across the country, but I think it's worthy of some conversation. Uh, hi, my name is Cindy Gutierrez, and I'm the Director of Teacher Education at the University of Colorado at Denver. And um, we've had a, a rich partnership um, model for a long time, which has certainly helped us. I've heard a lot about this notion of relationships and things like that. And I'm wondering from your perspectives, because you all um, probably dabble in different ways when you think about policy and ed policy and, and what's going on. And one of the biggest pressures, even with our strong partnership model, is where teacher preparation is running up against measures of uh, educator effectiveness and what does that mean for practicing teachers holding on to their jobs. And so in Colorado, we were one of those states that quickly tried to move some policy lovers to move to a model of teacher evaluation where 50% of their evaluation will be based on student test scores, achievement growth, those sorts of things. And we're seeing huge sort of pushback even in our rich partnership to going I can't take the risk to help support 
teacher preparation and let this novice, even with my strong guidance and co-teaching, come in and take this on. So what do you see going on in that conversation as you see a lot of states running towards this as a way to get um, federal dollars or other reasons, uh, as well as how does it then bump up against how do we continue to support teacher preparation? Well, you know, um, one, one of the other beliefs that I, one of the other insights that I didn't talk about there was that uh, sort of in general, this is not specific to your response, but that teacher education uh, exists within an invisible sea of policy and that we have not been engaged in that policy game very well, but we are at the effect of those policies. So I believe strongly that uh, we must be aware and identify those policies and impacts they have on not us as you know protect our turf, but on the whole enterprise, if you will, and how that gets how that happens. So my encouragement is that uh, we look at our leaders in higher education, which is the little bit of the game I play in most of the time, and say you you need to be involved in this policy discussion and not in a defensive way, but in a way that talks about what are the practical applications of these policies and its impact, because there are always uh, unidentified and negative impacts on any well-meaning policy. And sometimes they're very good and unintended consequences as well. So try to sort those out and stay in discussion. Uh, it's tough because people, as Jim opened up with, they have the silver bullet. And in your state, uh, right now, the silver bullet is, you know, uh, measures of student uh, gain. And uh, I hope Katie Anthes uh, out there and head of educator effectiveness can have some um, uh, understanding of and under, you know, complexity and a, a broader uh, database upon uh, on which to build that response. I know in our state, we've been fortunate to have Gary Henry and Charles Thompson and others do some elegant research on value added using a much, a very rich database, which has helped inform our policymakers about it's not just a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I prepare them to teach and they go out and have a positive impact on student achievement. I think what Tom opened up with, some of the dimensions of what in, uh, it, NICTAF is all about, they talk about that last piece, which is a, as a, that school environment. That's not inconsequential to what can happen here. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to blow smoke, but I'm saying I understand the complexity of it, but we have to get in the game and help them understand that so they hear it not as a defensive, hold back the night posture. But we want to go there, but we need to go there with a set of tools and armaments and a complete policy structure that makes that possible to happen. Uh, I can think of uh, two pieces to an answer. The first is that uh, the resistance that we're increasingly seeing on the part of uh, schools and teachers to accepting student teachers is a symptom of the deficiencies of the traditional student teaching model, particularly in the current high stakes environment. Uh, where, where we see models like co-teaching, there's much less resistance. Uh, so I think these strategic partnerships have to be built in a way uh, that meets the needs of the P-12 educators and their schools, as well as those of higher education, perhaps in part through stronger professional development opportunities that are provided to those teachers as part of this partnership. The second thing I would say is that I think there is uh, a lot to be learned from the evaluation of um, of practicing teachers for the improvement of teacher preparation. The recent Gates study, uh, more effective teaching study, which looked at the relationship between uh, you know value-added measures of um, of teacher performance, uh, the uh, observation of their classroom instruction through five or six different observational protocols, and then uh, student feedback measures using Ron Ferguson's model. Those uh, 
have a lot potentially to inform uh, preparation programs, uh, but we haven't really seen this conversation go very far yet. Uh, so I'm hoping that that will occur, and I think higher ed has an important role to play in informing uh, the conversation about what meaningful prep, uh, evaluation programs are for teachers and other educators. Would you like to add something? Or Just uh, we'll St. Cloud, yeah, St. Cloud University has some research. I don't know if you've seen any of that or not. Where it does demonstrate that student achievement actually grows in co-teaching classrooms, and I. I think uh, whenever you're trying to change policy, my thought is you always have to have fact and fiction. You know, fact is the is the actual statistics and research, and the fiction actually is more just advocates, disciples, that are willing to say, you know, I've done it. Uh, I've, I've had people in my classroom. It worked. I enjoyed it. And if you could find a couple of disciples and some good research that would prove that it's beneficial, to me, that's about the only ammunition you have. And then if you can't get people to move, I don't know what else you do. But I, I think you try to go with the stones that roll initially in the hopes that it'll it'll catch on and pick up, which is what we're trying to do. We studied our pilot program carefully in Sioux Falls, the 10 students and the impact, academic impact that those students had. And we saw promising uh, numbers in math. Re uh, reading was <coughs> neutral, uh, no, no effect in that pilot year. We're hoping we're going to get better at that as we go, uh, but we are trying to study our research uh, as we implement this model to find out is it having an impact on student achievement. And of course, we're hoping it does so we could turn around and market it back to the K-12 and say, folks, you're better off with one of our students than if you do not, don't have one in your classroom. So.